I hope you all enjoyed the Be'er Sheva's exciting nightlife and then the good night sleep. So we can begin with the second day of our conference as well uh, as to the fourth session, Law and Conversion. The first speaker will be Ephraim, our friend, Ephraim Kanov Vogel. Ephraim is an Ivory University professor of Jewish history, literature and law at the Ber uh, Berman Revel Graduate School, Yeshiva University. Author of five books and more than 70 articles, his most recent book, The Intellectual History and Rabbinic Culture of Medieval Ashkenaz, won the 2013 Goldschirm Goren Prize here at the Department of Jewish Sport uh, in Ben Gurion University. Uh, for the best book in Jewish thought and the 2013 Schnitzer Prize from the Association for Jewish Studies for the best book in biblical and rabbinic literature. Professor Kano Fogel is a lifetime fellow of the American Academy for Jewish Research and a four-time fellow of the Center for Advanced Jewish Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Can you move it? Uh, the title of, uh, of his lecture will be uh, is a Tosafist uh, attitude toward conver converts to the Judaism and towards prospective converts between Northern France and Germany. Please. Sorry. Good morning. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Good. Okay. Uh, so that Rami. Rami has broken the cycle of jokes, so I will resist as well. Uh, I can tell you one tonight, not here, but I can tell you one tonight, and maybe I'll tell you another, but uh, let me start the uh, more serious uh, part, especially since uh, some of you have managed to actually be here at 9 o'clock when we begin. Uh, more than a half century ago, Morivi Rabbi Amanoach, my late teacher Jacob Katz, briefly sketched the attitudes of the Tosafists, who are the leading Talmudists, rabbinic scholars of northern France and Germany, and other related rabbinic decides displayed toward converts to Judaism. And I want to be very clear at the outset, I'm talking about the attitudes of these rabbinic leaders, not necessarily the phenomenon of conversion, but we can talk about that both in the paper and in the discussion. In doing so, Professor Katz identified several key Talmudic interpretations and halakhic constructs as the axes around which the rabbinic positions could be charted. At the very same time, Ben Sion Wachholder published a study on conversion to Judaism and Tosafist literature, and our chairman, Rami Reiner, Dr. Rami Reiner, has recently supplemented these efforts by focusing on the status of converts in the rabbinic thought of medieval Ashkenaz. Crucial to any such undertaking is the ability to distinguish between the attitude of a particular rabbinic authority to an individual convert to a ger and his sense of how accepting the Jewish how accepting the Jewish community should be of the halachic institution of conversion, giur or gerut as a whole. As an extreme example of this problematic, one cannot properly assess Maimonides' overall approach to conversion solely on the basis of the fact that he was obviously quite impressed, taken with, and encouraged by the commitment and knowledge of Ovadia Hager. This is not the Norman proselyte, this is Maimonides' Ovadia. Um, in medieval Ashkenaz as well, leading Tosafists and halachic authorities had many positive interactions with individual converts. And here, just to give a, a slight sample, this is really not what I'm going to talk about today. Again, this is well known. Rami has written about this too. Uh, Rabbeinu Tam, Jacob Tam, Rashi's grandson, uh, welcomed the convert into his home. Uh, apparently, they would welcome these converts, then debate what the status of Jewish law in terms of leading the grace after meals. Uh, uh, Paula Tartikoff yesterday mentioned the, uh, the convert who the father of Rav Yad, Joel Ben Isaac Halevi of Bonn, dealt with again. He was very impressed with his learning and questions arose. Could he be the prayer leader in Bonn or in Würzburg and other communities in the Rhineland? Could he study uh, the Bible from his Latin gloss book uh, rather than from the Hebrew? Interesting discussions. We won't go through that now, but these are all very positive attitudes. Occasionally things went wrong. Uh, there are cases of converts who ended up in rabbinic homes and when they died there ensued a tremendous fight as to who would inherit them. But again, the basic attitude to these converts was certainly uh, on the whole quite positive. Uh, 
dedicated converts to Judaism tended to reach out or to be brought to the attention of leading Tosafists in both northern France and Germany. And as I say, in turn, these rabbinic figures were often impressed with the achievements and devotion of these converts, welcomed them into their homes, otherwise expressed their gratitude and support. So that's not what I want to talk about today. What I want to talk about is the attitude of Tosafists toward the conversion process. Do we encourage? Again, I want to be clear, there's no mission here. There's no mission. But when converts or potential converts appear, what is the attitude of the Tosafists to these people? And here we will see very clearly, I think, and I hope to show, a split that wasn't true in the first case in terms of the admiration for people who made it through. But here we will see, I think, a policy difference between the Tosafists of northern France and the Tosafists of Germany. And again, for those of us in this business, uh, this distinction or the possibility of distinction between northern France and Germany has only really begun to be developed fully in the last couple of decades. It's very suggestive. People then tend to think a Tosafist is a Tosafist. You know, those are our guys and, you know, who can understand what they're doing? The fact is there are many interesting distinctions. Uh, as I like to tell my students, if you see distinctions between Germany and France in every case, you're seeing a mirage. If you fail to see these distinctions, you're making a mistake. So that's what we're going to do today, but I think it will have important implications for the conference. And I'm also actually very um, uh, uh, heartened by the fact, uh, uh, as uh, Ryan spoke about yesterday, we do have to be very clear as to process. So here we're looking at these rabbinic attitudes toward potential converts. What do we do with them? How do we deal with them in terms of procedure and so on and so forth? Just to give you a little bit of this tension, one more citation. Uh, while the leading 12th century northern French Tosafist and successor of Jacob Tom, of Rabbeinu Tom, his nephew Isaac of Dompierre, who died in 1189 uh, and is referred to by the acronym RE, which is basically saying Rabbi I. If you're Rabbi I, you're a pretty important guy, that's for sure. Uh, he wrote, quote, if potential proselytes are persistent in their sincere degree to convert, they're really strong in that, and are not accepted too quickly or for purposes of marriages, we should accept them. That's what he says. But he also maintains, on the basis of a Talmudic formulation, again I quote, that the divine presence rests fully only with families of pure lineage. So in short, and we can't get into all this today, we are dealing here with some rather nuanced texts and conceptions, both halachic and non-halachic or meta-halachic, whichever you like, whose valences are not always unified or unequivocal. <laughs> Again, while rabbinic attitudes toward conversion in northern France and Germany, those who actually did convert, were fundamentally similar, as we've very briefly seen, manuscript passages and the concomitant rereading of published materials suggest that the Tosafists in northern France were more welcoming and tolerant of prospective converts over time than were their German counterparts. Again, no mission, but this kind of tolerance. This can be seen not only with regard to the interpretation of descriptive Talmudic passages, but also in the ways that they framed and discussed the halachic requirements for conversion. This dichotomy is further supported by evidence from both Jewish and Christian sources, which suggests that there was a steadier stream of converts to Judaism in northern France than in Germany during the 12th and 13th centuries. There were converts in each area. Numbers were not large in each area. Again, based on research of others here, the suggestion is that the stream, and it's a stream, is a little bit steadier in uh, northern France than it is in Germany. And even more significantly, as we, we shall see, by aspects of the self-image of these often like-minded yet ultimately distinct centers of Jewish life and scholarship in Northern Europe. In addition, this distinction can also be correlated with the nature of the relationship between the Jewish populace in each of these geographic centers and the various groups of church figures who lived and served there. So once we lay out the Tosafist differences, I'd like at the end of the paper to try to suggest not only the halachic and rabbinic thinking that was working here, but perhaps some societal issues as well. Let me give you now some of the data. Northern French Tosafists dealt with procedural questions of how a particular conversion should be performed and with the problems that actually arose during that process. They did not merely put forward Talmudic interpretations or larger theoretical prescriptions in these matters. German Tosafists, on the other hand, commented on the, the relevant Talmudic passages and issued halachic rulings that were based on these passages, but these efforts tended to be much less innovative or reflective than those of their Northern French counterparts. 
thoughts. The German rabbis presented or summarized the Talmudic material with little or no comment, did not make efforts to correlate or to qualify the Talmudic requirements in the way that the northern French authorities did, and I'll give you a couple examples in a moment. Moreover, there does not appear to have been a single instance in which a German Tosafist, again a rabbinic authority, discusses in the period of the 12th and 13th century where it's pre-conversion, where a German Tosafist discusses or puts forward the case of a potential convert prior to his or her conversion. We'll talk about Sefer Hasidim as well, that's nuanced, but we'll get there. Whose conversion generated a specific halachic problem or query. Among northern French Tosafists, on the other hand, such in instances are relatively easy to come by. Again, we're not dealing with a plethora of information, but there you can find it. Not only in Tosafot texts themselves and their glosses to the Talmud, but also within their responses and briefer rulings. While documentation exists for northern French Tosafists who dealt with specific cases of, and questions of individuals undergoing a conversion process in the midst of some kind of process, there is no such documentation for German Tosafists. Now this finding is both surprising and suggestive because, because typically the writings of the German Tosafists were focused much more heavily on recording the application and halakhic policies and principles in actual cases, ma'asim. The German Tosafists love to tell the story of the case that occurred in place X and we ruled this way and we sent it to our colleague in the next place and he ruled that way and they go back and forth and forth and back. They do that a lot. Northern French Tosafists do that much less. Some might say hardly at all. With regard to matters of conversion, however, these patterns are, this very com common pattern is not at all evident, which further suggests that the relative silence and less nuanced approach maintained by the German authorities with regard to pre-conversion cases, I'll call them, and policies were carefully considered and quite deliberate. It's not an argument from silence. In short, it would appear that German Tosafists and rabbinic authorities during the 12th and 13th centuries were far less encouraging of potential comments, to, uh, comments, comments, comments too, to Judaism than their counterparts in northern France. And again, what follows now, let me just bring you in a little bit to these discussions. They tend to be abstruse, they tend to be scintillating, but let me just bring you into them a little bit. Let me give you a flavor for exactly what I'm talking about. Isaac of Dompierre, Pierre, who I mentioned above, dealt directly with a number of procedural problems and situations in connection with actual instances of, uh, instances of gay root of conversion. And he offers several creative Talmudic interpretations that address such matters, although he did not rule in a consistently lenient fashion. Now it's interest here doesn't equal leniency, interest equals interest. So we have a case of a conversion, a candidate for conversion who had been circumcised incorrectly, big mess, at night and in front of three individuals. Why that's a big mess in Jewish law is not the issue for now. Two of, who, two of the judges, two of the uh, supervisors also happen to be related uh, and couldn't serve technically on such a rabbinic court. They couldn't serve as judges. They were married to two sisters. And that's the case that Reed had in front of him. Now, Reed does come up with, after the fact, leniencies with respect to witnessing the immersion and the circumcision. These can be countenanced after the fact. The real question is how many of the judges have to be present through which part of the procedure. The re preferred that all three of them be there throughout. He was willing to be lenient. Uh, in fact, his biggest problem in this case is not the number, it's the fact that they're, well, he's got a number of problems, but anyway, uh, he's willing to be lenient after the fact with regard to some of this, but the Avad after the fact. For example, since the Talmud at one point in Tractate Yivamot allows the, the immersion uh, of the Ger to follow the model of the immersion of a menstruant for whom three male witnesses are not typically present. So if that immersion is allowable, we can after the fact. Now, obviously, these are not the same things in Jewish law. And the fact is, for those who are getting worried, uh, in terms of the immersion of a female uh, convert, the uh, three males don't witness that either exactly. So nobody should get too worried. Um, and yet the immersion, again, he says, is considered valid in that case here, too. However, where it is possible to do everything a priori in, a co in accordance with the court procedures indicated by the Talmud, even with respect to immersion and circumcision, this is clearly the preferred approach. And again, this was a case of somebody, I would say, Sha'omed al haperek This person was right there. This is a case that happened. So again, it's a pre, it's leading up to the conversion, and that's where Re gets involved. Re was asked about whether two converts were permitted to marry each other, and he responded in the affirmative. Other authorities were concerned about this, lest both partners return to their pre-conversion ways. And they cited proof, again, Ryan's talk about where the conversion is or isn't, and they cited proof from a Tosef 
a passage to this effect. Ri, however, saw no halachic difficulty in such a case, since the Talmud itself clearly does not prohibit <coughs> such a marriage. Um, and again, I was going to delete, I'll just mention, since uh, Paula mentioned it yesterday, Ri has a case of a convert who had accepted the commandments and had undergone circumcision, but did not properly immerse over a period of time. And again, the discussion is what to do if he touches Jewish wine and so on and so forth. Ri is right on the spot in this case, and it's an ongoing kind of a discussion. Ri's halachic sensibilities regarding the shortcomings in the case of an actual conversion court, briefly noted above, make their way into several collections of northern French, northern French Tosafot. Again, the discussion continues, although his insistence on requiring three judges a priori for all aspects of the conversion process did not. So here there are leniencies given that he didn't even suggest. Um, uh, uh, and uh, there are Tosafot passages, just to again give you some more examples, um, that discuss the ongoing occurrences of more common types of cases that required what I'll call well-based judicial services. One of the problems, since there are judges, the rabbinic figures or the figures participating in conversion constitute a rabbinic court. There's a broad problem in Jewish law uh, since the original smicha, the original ordination, not the blanket, the original ordination had been sort of terminated, truncated. How do we allow today, whether it's Middle Ages today or even 21st century today in some cases, how do we allow rabbinic courts to functions, function since they don't have this technical support of having the original smicha. So that's discussed in a number of different kinds of cases uh, and how do you overcome these kinds of things. Uh, there is discussion in Tosafo texts about gerut, about conversion. How can conversion take place without mumchim smuchim, duly appointed and duly licensed, it's more than just licensed, duly credited judges. And there's a great passage in one Tosafo which says, quote, just, and this is again a northern French text, just as the rabbis were concerned that borrowers should not be stymied, and that's why you can have rabbinic courts to collect debts, even though they are not uh, fully licensed as the Talmud would like based on this smicha problem, literally the door should not be locked in the faces of the potential borrower um, since the lenders would tend not to lend out money if there was no way that they could recoup their loss in court. They were also concerned about, quote, the door not becoming locked in the face of potential converts. Now we don't see the line of people waiting, but this suggests that for these French Tosafists, you've got to have personnel ready on hand to handle these kinds of situations. Interestingly, a second justification for the ability of judicial tribunals uh, uh, to function consisting of non-mumchim, non-fully uh, qualified experts, to continue to handle these cases of Geirut is found in another passage, and I'll give you the quote there. Regarding a convert, the word Lodoro Techem for all generations is written in the Torah, which suggests that these laws apply in all contexts, even though we do not now have mumchim, we do not have these experts, since there are no longer those who are ordained with the original smicha, the word ulodorotechem, for all generations forever. Here again, this Tosafist interpretation would appear to ratify the practice, the presence of actual halachic conversion activities that were taking place, so to speak, on the ground. Ree's leading student and immediate successor, Samson of Sons, does not refer to any actual case involving potential adult converts. However, he does describe the physical difficulties in performing the ritual circumcision or, extract, or extraction of blood for purposes of conversion on a one-year-old Christian child, which as he describes it is Bishunatenu, in our neighborhood who was being converted according to the Talmudic principle that a minor convert, a convert below the age of bar or bat mitzvah, the age of majority in this case, could be immersed and initiated into Judaism under the authority of the Jewish court. Again, an actual case of a ger katan, a baby, a one-year-old, that Samson of Sons is involved in in terms of the circumcision. Several of Rees' views, including both his leniencies and some of his concerns, make their way into the prescriptive Sefer Mitzvot, Sefer Mitzvot Gadol by Moses of Kusi, composed around 1240. Moses is a student of Rees' direct student, Judah Sirleon, so this material again is moving. Uh, Moses of Kusi lays out the details of the conversion process as they appear in several sugyot, several Talmudic passages in Tractate Yivamot. He notes that the requirements to inform the potential convert of a selection of a, uh, uh, a selection of difficult or costly commandments 
commandments that cost money and that can cause trouble. And of the punishments that were assigned for the violation of various commandments were intended primarily as a means of dissuading the candidate. And that's what most people say. But alternatively, Moses of Kusi says, this could also be a means of properly warning her or him in advance about what their new responsibilities would be as a matter of fairness and not necessarily as, as a means of dissuading them. So it's not all about dissuasion. It's a little bit of a sort of, uh, you know, contract here. Similarly, Sefer Mitzvot Gadol presents a series of views as to the desirability of converts for the Jewish people, reflecting the range of opinions that have been noted by Ri and other northern French Tosafists. And here again, Rami's written about this, including a formulation that compares converts most favorably to the Jews who stood at Mount Sinai. If we look at the way the German Tosafists and rabbinic authorities during the 12th and 13th centuries dealt with the Talmudic passages that discuss conversion, we are struck by the differences not only in terms of their conclusions, but also with respect to the methods employed and the halachic values expressed in the course of their interpretations. When Eliezer ben Nathan of Mainz, who dies around 1165, discusses in two places in his halachic work, Evan Hayezer, this material, he offer, offers little analysis of any of the procedures and does, does not address any deviations from the Talmud requirements before the fact or after the fact uh, that might have occurred, stressing that three rabbinic scholars must be present at both the point of initial acceptance and also when the acceptance is re-enunciated at the point of, immer of immersion for women as well as for men, which must take place during the day. So he doesn't talk about any way of resolving any problems here. He also repeats that the goal of imparting information concerning the stringent commandments is to dissuade the potential convert, and that's as far as he goes. Ravan follows the Talmudic material to the letter, and he does so in a way which suggests that there was nothing especially current here. The nature of Jewish legal writing is you discuss laws that are on the books, not necessarily the sacrificial right, as Maimonides does, you discuss laws that are on the books as they emerge from the Talmudic discussion, and you really have to see, as Professor Katz used to say, Ratsui o Matsui, is this what we would like to have happen if a case comes up, or is this something on the ground? From here, it does not appear to be on the ground in the ways and with the exigencies that we saw uh, for Re and for others in uh, northern France. Uh, Ravia's grandson, uh, I'm sorry, Ravan's grandson, Ravia, Lezer ben Joel Halevi, he dies around 1225, also appears to have been rather unyielding with regard to the composition of the rabbinic court of various facets of Geirut, and more interestingly, even moreover, Ravia sought to limit the possibility of a minor convert, and especially a baby or a very young child converting to Judaism, with that principle of Ger Katan, a minor convert can be brought in by the Beit Din, exactly opposite of what Sim Samson of Sons had done. In a really neat piece of Talmudic exegesis, but that's the interesting point here, Ravia maintains that what the Talmud means to say is not that the court can bring a little child, a baby, or a two-year-old, or a four-year-old, and have them uh, uh, immersed in the mikveh and go through the circumcision, all of that according to the process. Ravia says, rather creatively, that this refers only to a minor who had himself come before the community in its court. And as the minor had to present himself or herself and make the request, and therefore the court, even though the minor has not reached the age of majority, they can honor his or her request, even though he's techni technically not a full-fledged you know, adult in the sense of Baharabat Mitzvah. If, however, the minor does not want this change of status and can't make this, the, the request, a one-year-old, two-year-old, four-year-old baby, figure out what age it stops, a conversion performed by the Jewish court would not be valid. So he's sort of written out the whole... Oops. Show me motion. Okay. Nope. Yeah? Better? Okay. Irrespective of whether Ravia's limitation of this Talmudic law was cited or accepted, there are no references to any actual cases in German rabbinic literature in which a minor convert was converted to Judaism in Germany in this period. A similar kind of pattern is evident for Isaac ben Moses of Vienna, author of the Halacha Compendium Sefer Or Zarua, dies around 1250, just to sort of put it into 13th century as well. Here, Isaac studied in northern France uh, with students of Re, but he also studied in Germany with Ravia and Simchav Spire. Um, one of his responses in Sefer Or Zarua suggests that Isaac did not follow Isaac of Dampierre's halachic approach to converts, but identified instead with, which, with what I've been describing as the less, less flexible German approach. Uh, in fact, the one German 
Tosafist, who seems to have been a little creative here on this, was the aforementioned Simcha of Spire, although it's interesting that he cites this in the name of a northern French Tosafist, Judah ben Yom Tov, that a lone judge, one judge, could serve as a kind of specialist for this. That's a very big leniency, although again, there's no evidence that he ever put this into play. Now, the fact is, I have a piece on Sefer Hasidim, which in some ways would be very interesting. The problem here is, it's not a problem, but the fact is Sefer Hasidim is not a halachic work. Uh, it is composed in Germany exactly at the time that we're discussing. Let me just say a couple of things quickly and I'll get to the end and then perhaps in the questions later we can discuss more about Sefer Hasidim. Sefer Hasidim, Kedar Kol Bakodesh, as is typical, is of several minds. But if you look carefully, the positive statements about converts in Sefer Hasidim are about converts who've already converted. Talking about, or, or what should you do once you convert? There's a great passage about a convert. Better he should marry another convert who is a fine person like he than marry a, uh, to use a Paolo's expression, cradle Jew who's not as fine. The sort of right. Uh, very interesting. But again, that's talking about an ideal situation where the conversion has occurred. As far as uh, discussion, though, of pre-conversion, um, Sefer Hasidim, for example, maintains in one instance. Um, again, against the lenient rulings in northern France that we've seen, although it's not clear that he's responding to that, that if a male convert was not able to be circumcised due to the fears on the part of the local community about taking such a step, right, so that no immersion was able to take place either, his touch will render Jewish wine undrinkable, even as other Jews should not go as far as to feed him non-kosher food at this point. So he's not uh, quite as flexible as Re had been, and again, it's not clear that he's responding to Re, and he may not be, but he's got that much more uh, uh, sort of standoffish approach. Uh, another passage that I'll say a word about later, if I have a chance, that um, uh, Effie Shoam has written about, and perhaps he'll talk about, um, is that Sefer Hasidim advises an impotent man to marry a female convert, a Gioret, as per the Talmudic ruling, ruling that one who is impotent is permitted to marry a woman of lesser lineage. So again, you get that kind of statement. Um, and here, um, I, I'm going to just say a word about another halacha compendium, Sefer Asufot, a student of Ravi, uh, mid-13th uh, century. Um, he brings a whole passage here from a circumciser, from a gozer, from a mohel, about procedures for the circumcising of converts, and you'll say, oh, okay, here's German material, but let me just give you the following uh, careful uh, caveat. This section is characterized by a clear degree of strictness and rigidity, as we've seen in Germany. It opens with the need to inform the potential convert about the downtrodden state of the Jewish nation, as per the Talmudic instructions, which is told to the potential convert in order to dissuade him, adding, and here's the point, quote, most certainly at this time when there is a grave danger to life, conversions are not permitted. Now he then goes on to explain the rest, which means one of two things. If somebody is mit amates, if somebody goes further, ultimately won't stop them. Or it basically means I'm writing the rest, lieter se'et, because that's what a halachic work has to do. But basically this store, this shop, either actually or ideally, may already be closed. Uh, again, assuming that the candidate and the religious authorities nonetheless wish to proceed, the text continues with a very strict regimen about accepting the mitzvot. Again, noting that if the candidate resigns after hearing the list of commandments, I'll obligations and punishments, this is an acceptable consequence. It's clear that he's almost rooting for that. Uh, if the candidate thereby wishes to terminate the process, let him do so. Um, and, and again, there's another case here that's mentioned, what does not properly become a convert until he has undergone circumcision and immersion in that order, no room to move. Indeed, quote, there was a case in Mainz of a convert who was immersed and then circumcised. The rabbinic scholars of Mainz required him to undergo another immersion since, this must be, since immersion must be preceded by circumcision. Yet another example of the strictness of this text, but also this is the only example that I have found of a, uh, of a pre-convert process being mentioned in a German rabbinic text. Right, it's here with all of its, you know, sort of size and, and, and angst, uh, but that's about the only one. Uh, let me skip over now, try to get to the conclusion here. Um, uh, oh, I should mention one more thing from a Sefer HaSivot that's critical, very critical. In a brief section about a woman who seeks to convert, you're not going to love this, folks, neither the women or the men. A Sufo text calls for a woman to, the woman to fast each day, with the exception of the Sabbath, for a month before conversion. 
I mean, that's, you know, I don't want to get in trouble here. This was perhaps meant as an act of expiation, but nonetheless, this is not found in the Talmud. It's completely beyond any kind of halachic qualification, um, and there is no explanation, though, given for this practice in Sefer Asufot uh, itself. Uh, once again, according to Sefer Asufot, speaking specifically about a woman, if these demands cause the potential convert to walk away from the process, so be it. Um, uh, and again, though, if she moves forward, she cannot be immersed at night, only by day, and so on and so forth. In short, the rather detailed material in Sefer Sufot that I've just given you very, very briefly is in full accord with the more limiting approach to conversion that was advocated in Germany already beginning by Ra'avan. So let me cut to the, the possible explanations, and I'll be happy to hear what my colleagues think as well. There are two overarching issues or reasons that may account for the differences with regard to the acceptance of converts that we have outlined within the writings, and again I stress the writings, of the rabbis of northern France and Germany during the 12th and 13th centuries on both theoretical and practical levels. Differences are supported and confirmed by the smaller number of converts overall who appear to have been accepted in Germany as compared to northern France. And we're not dealing with large numbers in each place, but there is that point of comparison. The first is the value or consideration of lineage, yichus, and its role in the development and ongoing existence of the Jewish communities in northern France and Germany. As Avram Grossman has demonstrated, this concept or value is an exceptionally powerful one in Ashkenaz, meaning throughout this area, from the 11th century onward. However, while the rabbinic circles in northern Fra France placed significant value on this consideration, the rabbinic families of Germany were even more committed to it. That might not surprise you, but that's the fact. As noted toward the beginning of the study, Isaac of Dompierre was acutely aware on the base of a Talmudic formulation of the differences between converts and those born as Jews in terms of the possibility of their receiving the presence of the Shekhinah. That was the original citation that I give you, the Divine Presence. Nonetheless, there was little, if any, discussion within northern France about the practical application of this kind of larger spiritual principle, and there is no indication that marrying accepted converts who had expended full effort and intention during their conversion, again, mitam simli hit gayer, they did a very strong job, there's no indication that that constituted a diminution in any way in the individual status of the Jew who married them. As such, northern French rabbinic authorities did not hesitate uh, to rule leniently on behalf of potential converts and to deal with them benevol benevolently even before they had completed the conversion process. On the other hand, Sefer Hasidim, and again we just mentioned it briefly, but this is what comes out of one of those sections, and the contemporary German Tosis Ravia appear to have enunciated an, identif an identifiable hierarchy in this regard. Ra Ravia utilized the term, the select among your brethren, Muvchar Shebe Achicha, to characterize the members of the large Jewish community who must be especially careful in terms of marriage partners and may not marry a female con a, a convert, right? Or a, uh, a interestingly, Shivcha Kananit, a Canaanite servant, talking about servants in the homes. The Chacham, the uh, wise advisor in Sefer Chasidim, ca uh, counsels individuals on instances in which it, it is appropriate to marry women with quote-unquote defective or lesser yichus. In one such discussion, Sefer Chasidim actively follows the Mishnah and Talmudic prescription that an impotent man should marry a gioret, a female convert. Given the extra measure of sensitivity to these considerations of yichus, of lineage, found among the Jewish communities in Germany, it may be possible to understand the relative stringency and inflexibility that German Tosafists and other rabbinic scholars there displayed with regard to the Talmudic regulations go governing conversion, as well as their hesitancy to rule even in the case of potential converts in practice, as we've noted, even as they fully welcomed those who made it through this arduous process in any case. Perhaps even more telling, however, in this case, is that there appears to have been a significant difference in the ways that the Jewish community, communities of northern France and Germany interacted with the surrounding Christian society in this regard. Conversion to Judaism, no need to stress this to this audience, was a grave offense throughout Latin Christendom during the medieval period, to put it mildly. And there were a host of doctrinal and temporal texts and materials that speak strongly against this possibility. There is evidence that suggests that during the 12th century, when efforts to, pre to prevent conversion to Judaism were largely in the hands of local bishops, and in the first hands of half of the 13th century, when the responsibility of enforcement of this restriction was transferred in large measure to the mendicant orders, both the local bishops and the mendicant friars were closer in terms of proximity to and possible impact on the Jewish communities in Germany as, uh, than they were to the communities in northern France. And I have a whole footnote about this, uh, most interesting, I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with the dissertation, some probably are very familiar, by J.D. Young, neighbors, partners, enemies, Jews in the monastery in Germany in the high Middle Ages, where he makes a very interesting argument about where the church officials lived, where the Jews lived, and that seems to have been the case only for Germany, uh, not for northern France. Thus, um, uh, 
uh, I'm sorry, let me just, uh, it should be noted um, that in, two, I'll also note that in two recent studies on rabbinic attitudes toward apostates, Mishumadim, a little discussion yesterday, during the late 12th and early 13th centuries, I have found that German Tosafists were uh, somewhat, somewhat, maybe even significantly more sensitive than the northern French counterparts towards separating these apostates from the larger Jewish community. Jewish apostates who wish, who wish to return to the community were allowed to do so only after demonstrated acts of repentance and a clear rejection of their prior state, again, a little more prevalent in Germany even than in northern France. Thus, while there is little, if any, mention in Jewish sources about Christian pressure, pressures against conversion to Judaism in northern France, in Jewish sources, there are several explicit and strongly worded reflections of this concern in Germany. In addition to the statement in Sefer Asufot that I mentioned above, that it is presently a sakanat fashot, a mortal danger, to convert anyone to Judaism, and the passage in Sefer Hasidim, which indicates, I didn't mention this one, but it's, it's in there, which indicates that the circumcision of a potential convert could not be performed because the Jews of his town fear doing so lest the Christians become aware of it. I did mention that, right? He said, if you can't do it because you're afraid the authorities will come, these are German sources. Mayor of Ruthenberg, who dies in 1293, describes the case of four Jews who were ordered by the ruling authorities to testify under oath about the identity of a fifth Jew who was a convert. They faced confiscation of their property and more if they did not tell the truth. Although they would have been permitted on a technical level to swear falsely that the fifth Jew was not a convert or to otherwise prevaricate in their response, even if they would thereby have been required to forfeit some of their own assets, since this was a case of sakanat nefashot, their lives were on the line, they testified indeed instead that he was indeed a convert. Now here's the result. Maharam Mayer notes that most fortuitously this convert was not burned at the stake, adding, quote, that the heavens had great mercy on him, since Mayer would have believed, again, a quote, that not one in a thousand is saved from this fate, since even when apostates from Judaism to Christianity testify convert against the convert to Judaism, he is burned, the convert. How much more so when Jews testify against him? So Mayer is amazed that there was no further action taken. Instead, the convert was assigned a very stiff monetary penalty in this instance, for which, according to Mayer, the other Jews involved were required to repay. <laughs> they had to help him in that. It is Mayer's great astonishment, however, that the convert escaped the fate of being burned at the stake in this instance, which was otherwise apparently enforced, and that is indeed most striking. Similarly, responds by Chaim Eliezer, the son of Isaac Orzur of Vienna, himself a student of uh, Mayor of Rothenburg, mentions the case of a certain Rabbi Isaac who took upon himself to circumcise converts. And as a result, his community was, was placed under some kind of serious charge or threat to physical, physical perse persecution. It's described simply as an alila, a libel, some kind of charge uh, by the Christian authorities. Taken together, all of these various rabbinic sources suggest that the pressure being brought to bear by the Christians in Germany when Christians converted to Judaism was often a lot more than just rhetoric. Here's the final paragraph. Although manuscripts of prayer books and machsorim of German rites from the 13th and 14th centuries retain the special blessings to be recited at the circumcision of a convert, their presence may be akin to the materials we mentioned before found in Sefer Asufot. Even though he says, let's not embark on this path, he lists the laws. The laws and procedures for conversion must always be kept on the books as part of the halachic and ritual process. Nonetheless, the extent to which these blessings had occasion to be recited in medieval Germany remains unclear, and posture remains very withdrawn, as I've indicated with great detail. At the same time, their recitation in northern France during this period, with the blessing of the rabbis, the Tosafists, appears to have been more likely. Thank you. Uh, Roy uh, obtained the BA from the Hebrew University and the Master's and Doctorate from Oxford University. was a postdoc in Lincoln College, Oxford, founded by Yad Nadiv and the Hardy Foundation. Continued to Trinity College, Cambridge, as a junior research fellow and is now lecturer in early medieval history at University College Dublin. Is founder and co-organizer of the Converting the IELTS, IELTS Research Network, founded by the Liverpool Trust, he publishes mainly on conversion to Christianity, early medieval canon law, historiography, and textual criticism. <laughs> Texts as sources for the history of conversion in early medieval Europe. So we are rewinding uh, much further back than we've uh, had already. 
early medieval Europe, um, conversion from paganism to Christianity is something completely different. And I'll be concentrating on three issues. The first is normative texts as witnesses to what came before Christianity. The second is normative texts as witnesses to a dialogue between Christians and pagans. And finally, normative texts as witnesses to clerical responses to uh, pagan customs and uh, religious practices. Uh, these three issues are fundamental to any investigation uh, of conversion to Christianity in Europe. And the heuristic of examining them through the prism of normative texts is that we are then able to consider normative texts as both sources for conversion history and as texts that may themselves be the products of conversion. I will conclude my paper by making a few general remarks about the, um, the value, the, the utility of uh, using normative texts in conversion studies. But let me begin with explaining what I mean by normative texts. So broadly speaking, I mean texts that prescribe behavior rather than describe behavior. Uh, so what immediately comes to mind are, of course, legal texts, texts of law, but the definition can never, nevertheless be much uh, broader than that. So, for example, normative texts can be texts of jurisprudence, uh, which is to say te te texts about law rather than texts of law. They can also be, for example, papal letters. Uh, papal letters technically are canon law. Uh, in the jargon, we call them decretals. And in this talk, we will meet a couple of uh, decretals. We will counter a number of different other forms of uh, normative texts as well. But what all the uh, texts that I'll be uh, mentioning today have in common is that they were themselves written by uh, Christian clerics, and they therefore suffer from an inherent yet uh, very predictable uh, Christian and ecclesiastical bias. And it is also worth reminding ourselves that uh, normative texts are first and foremost <coughs> texts. And as such, they are rhetorical constructs with all the usual caveats that apply uh, to texts of this kind, or to uh, works of this kind. So let me push on with um, the first topic, which is normative texts as witnesses to uh, pre-Christian practices. Our problem with observing practices of this kind, pre-Christian practices, is that we suffer from an almost wholesale uh, evidential deficit. And this doesn't just have to do with uh, normative texts, but uh, we lack any kinds of texts dealing uh, not necessarily directly, but comprehensively uh, enough with uh, this topic. Now, we can, of course, catch glimpses of certain pre-Christian cults from inscriptions, from contemporary chronicles, from origin legends, from histories, various other kinds of texts. But there are no early medieval texts that offer coherent mythologies, uh, for example, like the uh, Germanic mythology we find in Snorri Sturluson's 13th century poetic Edda, or the Celtic mythology developed by the 12th century versions of the Ulster Cycle. Of course, these later mythologies are themselves uh, artificial constructs, and they're not reliable guides to any uh, practice of any uh, cult. So the choice to turn to normative uh, texts as sources for pre-Christian practices is partly driven by a need to compensate for this evidential deficit. In turning to normative texts as sources for pre-Christian practice, there are two questions that stand out. The first is, do we have evidence of legislation that can be considered non-Christian? And the second, do we have surviving anti-pagan legislation that reveals, in passing, anything significant about paganism itself? To answer the first question, we must first agree on what it is that we mean, or what it is that I mean when I say non-Christian legislation. After all, why should we expect any legislation to have a religious import, a religious dimension to it? And indeed, we shouldn't. Instead, what I mean by non-Christian legislation is simply laws that are incompatible with fundamental Christian teachings. We find echoes of such laws, uh, but these are extremely rare. Um, for example, we have a surviving early medieval uh, Irish law tract called Cain Lanovna uh, that deals with the regulation of polygamy, so not very Christian. Um, in the Lex Frisionum, for example, uh, we find uh, clauses forbidding violation of pagan cult sites. Again, not something particularly Christian. But even when we have stipulation of these kinds, it is unclear uh, if they were meant to be implemented or if they were written simply as an antiquarian record of customs that were dying out as Christianity became more prevalent. This leads me to my next point, which is that we have no written legislation surviving from Germanic or Celtic cultures before they were converted. 
In fact, it's a cliche of medieval studies that the earliest law texts are written as a consequence of conversion to Christianity. Like any cliche, this is not entirely accurate, but we definitely find some clear examples of this, um, such as the case in Ireland, in Anglo-Saxon England, uh, with the Frisians, and with the Alemanni, and there are several <coughs> other examples that one can cite. <coughs> However, occasionally pre-Christian statements get assimilated into the new uh, Christian leg legislation, like the uh, Lex Frisionum that I, uh, that I mentioned. And I'll return to this assimilation in the third part of my talk, when I'll be discussing uh, the clerical response uh, to uh, pagan uh, practices, to pre-Christian uh, practices and laws. And now for the second question regarding uh, anti-pagan legislation. Although legislation of this kind is not unusual, in fact it's, it's quite rife, it is very rare to find detailed, or I should emphasize, it's very rare to find detailed descriptions of pagan practices. And when we do find descriptions, they're more often than not succinct, and their language can be obscure or ambiguous. And perhaps understandably so, because these texts were not concerned with ethnography, and their authors did not want to be seen to edify or reinforce non-Christian beliefs or practices. One of the most famous declamations against pagan practices is found in the so-called First Capitulary to Saxony, dating from around 782, but uh, the date is controversial. It is concerned mainly with imposing punishments on those who persisted in their pagan observances, failed to observe Christian rites, or did not give alms to the church. Frustratingly, the pagan observances that were rejected are mentioned in terse language with disappointingly few details. So, for example, the sixth uh, clause of the capitulary uh, stipulates, and I read from it, if anyone deceived by the devil believes in the way that pagans do, that some man or woman is a witch and eats people, and if for this reason he burns her and gives her flesh to be eaten, or eats it himself, he is to suffer the capital punishment. And I'll also cite from clauses 21 and 22, which are also of interest, but just as, uh, just as laconic as clause number six. So clause 21 reads, uh, if anyone offers a prayer to springs or trees or groves or makes any offering uh, after the fashion of the pagans, 60 solidity. And the 22nd reads, we command that the bodies of Christian Saxons be brought to the church's cemeteries and not to the burial mounds of the pagans. Now, this latter clause, this last clause, is very interesting because legislation regarding Christian burial is not as frequent as one might expect in the uh, early Middle Ages. In fact, this clause is the earliest example of legislation concerning uh, church burial from continental Europe. Nevertheless, it tells us nothing about the reason why burial outside the church's perimeter was considered so offensive. We may speculate that at least one reason was an objection to the cult of ancestors practiced at family cemeteries, and I'll come back to this later. But of course, much crucial information is missing. Apart from not being told anything significant about the burial rites that Carolingians objected to, we are not given any details about the rites performed around springs or groves, nor about the belief in the existence of witches. So one is left wondering what kind of deities uh, were, venera were venerated around springs and groves, what exactly constituted a witch, how many warts did you need to have to be uh, considered a witch, and what was considered witchcraft. No, no details are given. Now, in this slide, I listed a few more texts that touch on paganism in the same way, which is to say that uh, they mention veneration of features in the landscape, which is divination, and so on, but only as phenomena to be avoided and without any meaningful uh, details. I will not cite from them because I don't want to uh, labor the point. Like the capitulary, they also tell us that paganism was bad, but they don't tell us what paganism was. Obviously, all these texts share a common objective, which is to condemn anti, uh, uh, anti, so to condemn non-Christian practices and to uh, forbid them. What they do not try to do is to engage in persuasion. They do not try to convince anyone of the wickedness of paganism or the virtues of Christianity. The capitulary of 872 being an extreme example of such a disinterest in persuasion. It reflects Charlemagne's policy of conversion at any cost, even at the point of the sword. If we define normative texts as texts that prescribe behavior, then there's actually every reason to expect that some of them would, in fact, try to persuade their readers to behave differently. 
but perhaps we shouldn't expect this of formulaic legal texts like the capitularies. However, we are fortunate enough to possess other types of normative texts addressed either directly or indirectly to practitioners of pagan rites, usually to the aristocrats among them. And these texts bring me to the second uh, part of my talk concerning the dialogue between Christians and pagans. Such a dialogue could come in different forms and could take place continually rather than just at the early stages of the penetration of Christianity into society. Nevertheless, the most important among the texts that preserve what I would call an echo of a pagan voice usually date from missionary eras. They are invariably texts of canon law, but of a very particular kind of canon law. Formally speaking, they are papal decretals. But they are decretals structured in the form of a catechism, so question and answer. They record papal responses to questions posed either directly by non-Christians or by missionaries speaking on behalf of the non-Christians. I will mention two texts of this kind. The first is commonly known as the Libellus Responsionum, and the second, the Consulta Vulgarorum. The Libellus Responsionum is universally recognized as the earliest expression of canon law from Anglo-Saxon England. It is essentially a reworking of correspondence between Pope Gregory the Great and his emissary to Anglo-Saxon England, Augustine, who uh, would eventually, at least according to Bede, become the first Archbishop of Canterbury. Mm -hmm. The correspondence has been reworked into a catechism which became very popular in continental Europe, circulating both independently and in fragments that were incorporated into other uh, just as influential normative texts. So, we have here uh, an extremely influential uh, normative text that originated from a missionary era. In theory, at least, it can be potentially revealing of the reality that the missionaries found on their arrival in Kent. Many of the clauses in the libellus deal with ritual purity. So, can a woman enter a church during her monthly period? Can a man receive communion after dreaming about sex? Can a priest who dreamed about sex celebrate mass? And so on and so forth. Ostensibly, what we see here are challenges raised by non-Christians to the missionaries who were intent on converting them. The questions themselves can, in theory, and I emphasize in theory, suggest something about pre-Christian customs. If so, these customs may contain the vestiges of pre-Christian notion, notions about ritual purity, customs that native communities uh, were not sure whether they should be carried over into the Christian era. However, the libellus raises important interpretative difficulties that apply not only to Anglo-Saxon England, but also to other places in Europe that had been affected by Christianity before they were formally Christianized through missions. One such challenge was raised by Rob Mays, who argued that the customs reflected in the libellus may not be pagan at all, but local Christian customs which lingered in a morphed way from Roman times. Subsequently, Ian Wood argued that the customs in question were pagan, but, and I quote, Anglo-Saxon paganism was already modeled in part on Christianity even before Augustine arrived. Now is not the place to debate the validity of either argument, but the theoretical point that Wood makes, that Ian Wood makes, is worth reiterating, which is that conversion is not a one-way street. This observation is reinforced by studies by Walter Paul for the Lombards, um, by Kim McCone uh, for Ireland, and by Leslie Abrams uh, for Germanic Christianity more generally. And we will look more closely at this issue uh, later. Now, for the purpose of the present talk, what is important to note is that a normative text of the catechetical variety, which is this, opens a window onto the complexities of the conversion process, and thereby it allows us to see the dynamics by which ideas from pagan society were adapted to Christian society, but also sometimes vice versa. By observing this process, we gain an insight into specific practices, be they pagan or hybrid pagan and Christian. I now move on to the uh, second uh, text, the second catechetical uh, text that I uh, said I'll talk about. This is the Consulta Bulgarorum, and I'll be reading from this in a minute. The Consulta is the edited correspondence between Pope Nicholas and Khan Boris of Bulgaria, dating from 866, shortly after Boris's nobles rebelled against him, allegedly for imposing Christianity upon them. In the process of recovering from the revolt, Boris addressed 104 questions to the Pope in order to try to reconcile some prevalent traditional customs with Christianity. 
But Boris also deliberated between Christian observance as espoused by the Pope and observance as espoused by Patriarch Photius of, Alexander, of Constantinople. Sorry. Boris's questions to the Pope survive in paraphrasing Nicholas's replies, which uh, are here, or two of them are here. So uh, I'll cite from these examples. So Pope Nicholas says, as for your kinsmen who die unbelieving, one may not pray for them because of the sin of unbelief. According to John the Apostle who said, there is a sin unto death, I say that it may not be prayed for. A sin unto death is that of those who die in the same sin. So here we have Pope Nicholas taking an unusually tough stand against remembering the dead in prayer. Not only is Boris forbidden from venerating his ancestors, but also from praying for them because they died as unbelievers. Nevertheless, Nicholas's position expresses, so, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Nicholas's position is expressed as part and parcel of a dialogue, and there's an element of persuasion because a biblical rationale is given. And here's another uh, quotation from the Consulta. The number of days that a man must abstain from his wife after she had given birth have been pronounced not by us, but by Pope Gregory the Roman of holy memory and apostle of the English race who wrote to Bishop Augustine whom he sent to Saxony, and this is what Gregory said, his husband should not approach his bedfellow until her infant is weaned. So what is interesting about this is that the consulta cites Gregory's Libellus Responsiorum, which we've seen a minute ago. Now, this intertextuality is important because it testifies to a certain continuity across time and cultures in papal approaches to the practicalities of dealing with the newly converted. And it also suggests that there was an awareness to maintaining consistency within the normative tradition regarding newly converted communities. One is again left to wonder as to the source of the question on abstinence. Was it a lingering pre-Christian custom, a Byzantine custom, or a custom that arrived in Bulgaria from another Christian authority? It could, of course, be a question inspired by reading of the Bible, by reading of Leviticus, maybe indirectly via the Khazar Empire, depending what your views are about its conversion rate and stage. So these are pretty much the same questions that vexed us, or at least vexed Ian Wood and Rob Mays with regard to the Libellus Responsiorum. And now come to the third part of my talk, concerned with the evidence that normative texts afford for the clerical responses uh, to pre-Christian pre practices. Responses range from inaction through assimilation to outright rejection. We've already encountered cases of rejection, so I will concentrate on inaction and assimilation. Inaction is only of interest when it can be shown to have been a deliberate choice. European clerics in late antiquity and the early Middle Ages often chose not to interfere with certain deeply rooted customs. Again, the emphasis is on choosing to do that. They might have been worried that challenging such customs could upset sensitive social norms and antagonize the newly converted. A famous example is St. Martin of Tours, who is said by his hagiographer, Sulpicius Severus, to have condoned traditional pagan burial rites because he argued that there was nothing religious about those rites. They were simply folklore for Martin. They're, they're, they were not a religious uh, practice. Valerie Flint, in her landmark study of magic in the early Middle Ages, has written extensively on the rebranding of religious customs as folklore or folk magic. This rebranding legitimized clerics to keep out of potentially controversial issues. So the goalposts, as you can see, were not fixed, but they were constantly shifted. What was religious sometimes, uh, well, the, the boundaries changed. What was religious could sometimes be rebranded as folklore. Examples of inaction in canon law texts can be detected especially in relation to burial rites and marriage customs. These are areas where, where an argument from silence is possible because burial in social conventions regarding sexual unions, for example, uh, marriages, are central to every human society. So if canon law texts do not legislate about them, it must be from choice rather than oversight. Sexual unions, including marriages, were explored extensively by James Brundage in his now classic Law, Sex, and Christian Society in Medieval Europe. His conclusion was that, at best, medieval legislators only paid lip service to forbidding concubinage and other forms of illicit unions. But more often than not, they preferred not to stray into this territory at all. 
Another way of dealing with persistent pre-Christian traditions was to assimilate them. And what I want to concentrate on now is the assimilation by Christians of pre-Christian law itself. Okay? So how was pre-Christian law assimilated into uh, a newly formed Christian society? The Irish normative tradition offers the best examples for this. Assimilation did not simply mean dressing up traditional law in a Christian guise, but first and foremost it meant positing a rationale that could justify integrating two potentially contradictory normative systems. So in other words, they were looking for a rationale for syncretism. Now, I say two uh, normative systems, but the truth of the matter is that Latin Christendom did not have a coherent nor comprehensive normative framework before the Decretum Gratiani in the 12th <coughs> century. There was no concept of canon law as such. Sure, ecumenical councils were recognized as a compelling central canonical strand, but they failed to answer the growing local concerns of communities scattered on the fringes of Christendom. You could also argue that everyone agreed, at least formally, that the ultimate authority resided with the Pope. But below the Pope, there was a proliferation of bishops and provi provincial church councils that issued their own canonical pronouncements. Now, the pronouncements of these different councils could be, and were, uh, sometimes at least, contradictory. So, in the absence of a general binding framework of canon law, missionaries could easily find themselves embarrassed when faced with an existing, elaborate, and fully functional native judicial system, and they sometimes encounter that. The missionaries, the, sorry, the missionaries would then be hard pressed to offer an alternative, or even to convince the native population that it needed an alternative. If you have a functioning, existing uh, legal system, why do you need something else to replace it? In Ireland, for example, we find a comprehensive system of vernacular law. In fact, it is the most comprehensive vernacular law system uh, from early medieval Europe, with laws spanning six volumes in the latest modern edition. And by comparison, uh, Anglo-Saxon law, up to and including King Alfred, um, add up to about 30 pages in the latest modern edition. And that's the second largest vernacular law corpus from early medieval Europe. Now, the fact that some cultures possessed a robust legal system that could not have been simply wiped out prompted some clerics to seek to adopt existing rules that they found. So if you can't beat them, you join them. A classic example of this are the two most comprehensive collections of law from early medieval Ireland, the Hibernensis and the Shenchos Moor. The first was written in Latin and is commonly classified as canon law. It circulated widely in continental Europe. The second was written in the vernacular, but influenced by Christian teachings nevertheless, uh, and its circulation is restricted to uh, Ireland. Both preserve for us vestiges of a dialectical process of toing and froing between native law and Christian ideals through which new Christian law was formed. The influence of native law is apparent throughout this process. But what is of particular interest to me, again, is the rationale for assimilating pre-Christian traditions into an emerging new Christian law. So I'm focusing on the rationale. The principle that enabled this assimilation was a well-known method adopted from biblical exegesis. It was the method of prefig prefiguration. The pre-Christian law was treated as a prefiguration of Christian law in exactly the same manner that figures or events in the Old Testament were seen to prefigure the New Testament. And in good Old Testament fashion, legislators also invoked prophecy. We can see this exeg exegetical uh, principle stated explicitly in the Shenchas Mor. Then it was entrusted to Duvtach, Duvtach is this prototypical scholar, to display judgment, and every law that held sway among the men of Ireland was in the judgments of the island of Ireland and among the poets who had prophesied that the white language of the Beati should come, namely the law of scripture. For the Holy Spirit spoke and prophesied through the mouths of the righteous men who were first in the island of, of Ireland. For the law of nature reached many things that the law of scripture did not reach. In other words, Irish law is said to have prefigured the law of scripture. They got there first. And for that reason, uh, Irish law can be sanctioned for Christian use. Somehow, 
Christianity was embedded within it. But in discussing clerical responses, it is also important to uh, note how the church could sometimes subvert the native legal system. And my example for this has to do with the legal status of individuals. Irish vernacular law is infamous for its elaborate yet strict and formal social stratification and the legal rights that are enjoined to each rung of society, from the lowest grade of commoner to the highest grade of king. However, Irish canon law rejects this hierarchy entirely, and it doesn't uphold any legal distinction between persons. It goes further and claims that all are equal in adjudication, a claim only otherwise known from Visigothic law, where the king is said to be equally bound by the law as his subjects. There's no evidence as to whether these pronouncements regarding equality, or anything else for that matter, were ever implemented, or even whether they were meant to be implemented. They do, however, show us what kind of Christian society the clerics envisaged. The reasons why clerics should seek to reform aspects of society in the way uh, that they did are very complex and they're not always benign. Clerics would have all sorts of strange reasons to reform society, many of them just to do with money. But, but, but at the very least, uh, these pronouncements, these statements about reform, allow us an insight into a very particular kind of clerical mindset. Now, for my conclusion, I'd like to uh, take you through a number of reasons why normative texts should be of interest to uh, historians of conversion in early medieval Europe, hopefully to historians uh, of conversion elsewhere in other periods. And these reasons uh, emerge from the foregoing discussion. The first reason is simply that uh, they survive in relative abundance, and there's a great variety of them. This is especially true of canon law, much of which still remains to be edited. So if anybody is looking for another research project, this is a very uh, promising avenue. The second reason why uh, law texts are useful is that some of them contain expressions of religious beliefs and values. And this was the reason that I stressed the most in my paper today. Some texts were indeed written at times when societies were undergoing religious change. But we must remember that laws are primarily guides to perceptions rather than practice. But perceptions, of course, are also very important. The third reason is that laws offer a convenient comparative criterion that cuts across European cultures. As such, they are a very useful, useful yardstick for comparative history, what Carlo Ginzburg would call keyholes. And we got a taste of this uh, with the burial customs practiced by different cultures. But there are several other examples uh, for this. The fourth reason is that the transmission of normative texts, uh, the transmission of ideas from normative texts, and the circulation of the manuscripts in which they were contained can themselves be very instructive. In this talk, we only saw transmission in action in the context of ritual purity. So remember the connection between the libellus and the consulta. But there are, again, countless other examples of this. Transmission can also facilitate the comparative angle that I uh, mentioned a minute ago, because the changes that texts undergo as they were transmitted can tell us something about regional variation in both the interpretation and sometimes even the application of law. Indeed, um, gauging application of law is sometimes something we can only do uh, when we look at how texts are being transmitted, transmitted and how they mutate uh, through their transmission. The fifth reason, uh, which I uh, explored in the third part of my paper, is that we um, yes, is that we see law itself being formed dialectically uh, from a dialogue between pre-Christian and Christian. This was not a random process, but as I've argued, we find evidence of certain clergy establishing a conceptual framework based on exegesis for assimilating pre-Christian ideas. This dialectic was in itself a catalyst for the formulation of law, often in response to existing native uh, uh, legal traditions that Christians initially had little or nothing to offer in exchange for. So we see conversion being acted out as a dynamic process with no single vector, but as uh, a constant cultural negotiation. So thank you for your attention. speaker now in this uh, session is uh, Jesse Sherwood. Jesse earned her PhD at the University of Toronto and wrote her dissertation on Jewish uh, conversion.
She also has a master's of library science from the University of Washington. She was a postdoctoral researcher with Relmin in Nan and still contributes to their uh, database on occasion, which makes her an external contributor now. She has published, artic uh, she published articles on uh, uh, Guillaume de Fle, conversion during youth and adolescence uh, in inquis inquisitorial archives, and most recently on the living collection of Gerard of Mines. Since, as we know, these microphones are a bit gendered, I'm going to try to speak without which is generally considered one of my neatest tricks. Um, so, but if you cannot hear me, please wave in the back and uh, I'll uh, stick it somewhere. So this is a bit of a departure. I'm not going to be talking about sex, at least not very much, and I won't be talking about money, which seemed to be kind of a recurring theme in conversion here. I am, however, going to be talking about this space that was mentioned yesterday in conversion to Christianity between converting and being baptized. So it was lovely of uh, Professor Stowe to uh, set me up like that. So one of the things that medieval canon law talks about, or early medieval canon law, which is what I'm going to be um, dealing with today, is some of these details about how when and by whom converts, and specifically converts from Judaism, can or should be baptized. And baptism, of course, was Christianity's sacrament of initiation. So these questions offer some insight into what Christian ecclesiastical authorities hoped were feared or expected from these converts and their conversions. Now, contrary to what I sort of expected as a young graduate student, um, these authorities, their wishes and their worries were neither consistent or universal. They did not really agree on whether or not it was a great idea to baptize Jews, or at least to baptize them right away. Mm -hmm. And even where their underlying questions or concerns were similar, they could and did result in radically different conclusions. So fears about backsliding converts prompted one council to impose an eight-month catechumenate, another to forbid reversions altogether, and a third to insist that false or fictive converts should be pushed back to Judaism. Conversely, two papal decretals insisted that uh, Jews must convert voluntarily, but one did so on the grounds that doing otherwise imperiled convert souls, or imperiled these Jewish souls, and the other because it was like casting pearls before swine. And these canons and decretals, and of course it was very nice of Roy to define decretals for all of us, um, so I don't have to bother were often promulgated in response to specific queries, specific questions, and peculiar circumstances. And they could subsequently be ignored, forgotten, or lost, leaving a tangle of contradictory decisions about baptizing Jews and Jewish converts, which of course bedeviled the systemizing canonists of the later Middle Ages. For there were three, for lack of a better word, um, legal traditions, and there are three outliers that I will discuss today from the popes and the ecclesiastical councils of the 6th through the 10th century. And this cutoff point is very deliberate, in part because the 11th century marks a real turning point in canon law, and in part because of this issue we dis that was discussed very briefly yesterday between the idea of an internal and an external conversion. Up until the 11th century, I would argue that when Christians are talking about conversion, they are generally talking about external observances and rituals and rites, about a change of life and not really a change of heart. Of course, that's not all the time and there are exceptions, but generally in the early Middle Ages, this is what Christians are medieval Christ Latin Christians are talking about. And then of course, the 11th century it becomes much more an issue of belief and feeling and uh, anyway, uh, that's another topic for another day. These traditions, 6th century canon law, 7th century Visigothic canons and their heirs in Lyon, and the 10th century legislation on exile and baptism, these did not obviously supplant or evolve from one another, and there are additional three outliers which will sort of illustrate this point 
and hopefully I'll have time to talk about them. Um, and these are the Council of Paris, the Second Council of Nicaea, and the Consulta Bulgarorum. I'm sorry. Um, but examining together them together, I think, demonstrates the ways in which canon law reflected, refracted, and occasionally even shaped conversions, and was in turn shaped by them. And can you still hear me in the back? Great. In the early church, all initiates were carefully screened over a course of a three-year period of instruction, fasting, and penitence known as the catechumenate. After Christianity's official recognition in the fourth century, the catechumenate atrophied, except perhaps for converts from Judaism, who remained kind of a special case. Imperial legislation, or early imperial le Roman legislation, demanded that such converts be especially earnest in their embrace of Christianity. Two edicts from the Theodosian Code, one from 397 and the other from 416, declare that Jews seeking baptism must first clear themselves of all their debts and any criminal charges before they could be admitted into the church. And the second of these, the one issued in 416, insisted that imperial judges should return Jews, whom they see neither adhering to this cult with the constancy of religious confession, nor imbued by the faith and mysteries of the venerable baptism to their own law, that is to Judaism. Moreover, early Christian theologians, even those like Augustine of Hippo, who otherwise allowed or tolerated co the coercion of heretics and pagans to the official church, insisted that any and all converts from Judaism should be voluntary ones. And early canon law generally followed these sort of early precedents, creating extra hurdles for Jewish baptisms while maintaining that those conversions must be genuine. The earliest of these canons was promulgated at the Council of Agda in 506, and it declared that Jews, whose perfidy often returns to its own vomit, should stand with the catechumens on the threshold of the church for eight months if they want to come to the Catholic law. And if they are found to come with the pure faith, then they shall merit the grace of baptism. If, however, one became gravely ill during this period, he or she could be baptized immediately. Now, by the 6th century, an eight-month catechumen, it was an unusually long one. Most Christians in Gaul were baptized within a few days of their birth, and other adult uh, converts were only expected to wait about 40 days at most before they were baptized. So this additional six months prescribed by the council was not an inconsequential little addition. But the reasons for this lengthy catechumenate for Jewish converts are rather obscure. Now it's possible that Jews were sort of stood in by the council for the Arian Visigoths whom the Gallo-Roman bishops could not, or at least could not yet, openly criticize, um, which uh, William Klingshorn has suggested. Alternatively, as Paul McCart has noted, Alaric, the Visigothic king, um, issued sort of a review of the Theodosian Code earlier in the same year, to produ and which produced Alaric's breviary. And the breviary incorporated some of the Roman legislation concerning Jews and their status in Christian Christendom, but neither of the edicts imposing additional criteria for Jewish converts. So the council may have deemed this an oversight that they needed to correct. Um, however, it is also possible that one of the number, one of their number, one of the bishops at the conf, at the council, was embarrassed by a public reversion to Judaism, such as seems to have happened uh, quite often after most unenthusiastic baptisms in the early Middle Ages. And indeed, it's there were several cases in the fifth and the sixth century of kings and bishops attempting to compel Ju their Jewish subjects to accept Christianity through either explicit threats of exile or veiled threats of violence and with seemingly limited long-term success. And for this reason specifically, such coercive proselytism prompted Gregory I to send a decretal unasked, which is actually quite unusual, prescribing the practice in 591. Addressing himself to the bishops of Arles and Marseille, Gregory reproved them for trying to lead Jews to the baptismal font by force rather than persuasion. Although he praised their zeal, he chided their methods, saying, 
or writing, for when someone comes to the font of baptism, not through the sweetness of preaching, but through necessity, returning thence to their former superstition, they die in a worse state, since they would seem to have been reborn. Gregory thus instructed his bishops, or these bishops, to preach to the Jews instead in hopes that their listeners might themselves choose to change their old life, for then their souls do not go back to the original vomit. That's quoting directly from Gregory. He also discouraged less blatant methods of coercion, such as destroying synagogues or preventing Jews from celebrating their own holidays. Um, he was not, however, quite so absolutely insistent on sincerity as the council at Agda, suggesting that officials in Sicily might reduce converts' taxes and inducement to baptism. I guess there's a little bit of money in there. Gregory was not so enthusiastic about converting Jews, however, as to weigh the catechumenate. In May of 598, he wrote to Fantinus, the deacon of Palermo, requesting him to travel to Ag Agagento and instruct the Jews who the abbess of St. Stephen had informed him wanted to convert. And he wrote that if waiting until Easter, which at that point was, would be nearly a year away, seemed too burdensome, speak to the bishop there so he might baptize them with a the merciful protection of the Almighty God, either on a Sunday or a more solemn feast, if one should occur, after the indicated 40 days of penance and fasting. Gregory explained that their baptisms in this particular case should not be unduly delayed because there was a plague raging at the time. So while 40 days was normal as a catechumenate, here it's presented as a diminution, an exception being made in an exceptional circumstance. And despite the frequency with which Gregory addressed converting and baptizing other non-Christians elsewhere, particularly the English as we've heard, this was his only letter, or the only letter that survives, to require or even to refer to the catechumenate. So I think it's possible that Gregory retained some of this earlier ambivalence about baptizing Jews, or at least about baptizing them in a hurry. Now, canons issued in 7th century Iberia shared no such ambivalence about converting Jews, and even voluntary conversion faded as a requisite for baptism among the Visigoths. This trend was already apparent at the Third Council of Toledo, held in 589, which decreed that sons born from the unions of Jewish men with Christian wives or concubines, something it also forbade, should be baptized. And this accelerated after the Visigothic kings, beginning with Sisebut in 612 or 613, began periodically trying to compel the kingdom's Jews to convert. This policy was a notable failure, as Gregory had foreseen Few, if any, of the Jews who were reluctantly baptized became enthusiastic Christians or indeed Christians at all. But where Gregory pointed to such reversions as a reason not to compel Jews to accept baptism, successive councils of Toledo tried to damn, or tried to damn the falling tide. The first and most influential of these was the Fourth Council of, Cale of Toledo, convoked 20 years after Sisebut's first foray into compulsory conversion in 633. While it promulgated one, counts, one canon forbidding coercion, it insisted nonetheless that forced baptisms were binding on the recipients and issued several other canons to see that those people who were thus baptized became and remained Christians. The first of these, Canon 57, declared that because one could not be forced to believe or to be saved unwillingly, Jews ought to be induced to convert by the free use of their will rather than impelled by force. But whoever has already been compelled to come to Christianity, as was done in the time of the most pious Prince Sisebut, because they have already been associated with the divine sacraments, having received the grace of baptism, been anointed with a chrism, and shared in the Lord's body and blood, it is fitting that they be compelled to keep the faith which they have received by force or by necessity, lest the Lord's name be blasphemed and the faith, faith which they received deemed worthless and contemptible. Canon 59 decreed that baptized Jews should abandon Jewish rites, circumcision in particular, and be recalled to Christianity. Canon 60, which we will see again, demanded that Jewish children be separated from their parents and raised by Christians or in monasteries to learn the veneration of the faith. 
convert's children, provided they were faithful Christians, and there's really no indication of what exactly a faithful Christian is, were exempt from any penalties that might apply to their wayward parents by Canon 61, while Canon 62 prohibited baptized Jews from associating with their former co-religionists in the hopes of preventing such baptism of backsliding. Canon 63 enjoined Jewish men with Christian wives to convert if they wished to retain those wives, and decreed that children born of such mixed marriages should be raised as Christians. And presumably in a bid to forestall sort of Christian abetment of Jewish reversions, which we know did happen, the council also forbade Christians from accepting gifts or proffering support for Jews under the penalty of anathema and excommunication in Canon 58. Subsequent councils of Toledo reaffirmed these canons, but allowed the initial prescription of forced baptism to fade, particularly after Rensiswith and Erwig introduced their own programs of coerced conversion in 654 and 681. The Sixth Council of Toledo, held in 638, affirmed the, council, the canons of the Fourth, but it did so after praising that most excellent and Christian prince for choosing to eradicate completely the Jews' prevarications and superstitions and refusing to allow anyone who is not Catholic to remain in his kingdom. Similarly, the Eighth Council of Toledo in 653 condemned Judaism and reaffirmed the councils of Toledo IV again. However, those present did not do so because they worried about baptized Jews reverting, but because they deemed it unbecoming for Jews to live among Christians, or rather, in the words of the council, for an Orthodox prince to rule the sacrilegious or the faithful to be defiled by the society of the infidel. And there's sort of a tricky appendix in some redactions, but we really don't have time for that today. Two years later, the Ninth Council of Toledo did not affirm Toledo IV's canons. It expanded on them, ordering baptized Jews to celebrate Christian holidays and to spend Jewish ones under clerical supervision. At the Twelfth Council of Toledo convoked in 681, the prelate simply confirmed Erevig's legislation of the same year against the wickedness of the Jews and forbidding, forbidding them to withdraw either themselves or their children or their servants from the grace of baptism, to celebrate Passover or the Sabbath, to perform circumcisions or work on Sundays, to keep kosher or to marry close relatives, to leave the Visigothic kingdom, to insult Christianity, or to read books that Christians repudiated. Despite this rising stridency, 7th century prelates may not have been entirely unaware of the earlier laws they were flouting. Pope Honorius evidently sent the bishops a scathing letter in 638, which was then read at Toledo VI. And while this letter does not survive, a response penned by Braulio, the Bishop of Saragossa, does. And after expressing shock at being charged with whatever unspecified, unspecified shortcomings the Pope had condemned, Braulio remarked, and I'm not sure whether it was by the way or in direct answer to the Pope, while it is incredible to us and not altogether believable, it is reported to us that baptized Jews were allowed to return to the superstition of their own religion by the venerable decretals of the Roman prince. He then exhorted the Pope by virtue of his sanctity to bring the enemies of Christ's cross into the fold of Mother Church through his own preaching and diligence. So, you know, sort of carrying the war into the enemy's camp here, I think. The Toledan canon seemingly had no more impact on contemporary Spain than Honorius had on Toledo VI, but they cast long shadows in medieval canon law, not, I think, because they naturally supplanted their 6th century predecessors, but because they proved useful elsewhere. Circulated as part of general collections, like the Collectio Hispana and the Collectio Hispana Systematica and the pseudo Isidorian decretals, some of these canons were incorporated into specialized compilations, and others were repromulgated at the Council of Paris Mieux, held in 845 and reconvened in 846. Now, the resurrection owes much, I think, to the Diocese of Lyon, a center for jurisprudence and something of a conduit for Visigothic collections moving northward. There, two of the city's bishops became embroiled in a protracted struggle with the local Jewish community and imperial authorities over their baptism or proselytism of Jews and their slaves. 
and with the aid of the deacon and the head of the diocese, Scriptorium Floris, they mined these earlier collections for ammunition, appealing to earlier conciliar canons as well as to Roman law, in a largely unsuccessful bid to circumscribe the imperial laws that checked their proselytizing. Agabar, Bishop of Lyon from 816 to 835 and again 838 to 840 began proselytizing Jews and more particularly their slaves, which not surprisingly um, annoyed the local Jewish community and they complained to the imperial court and the imperial court upheld its prohibition against baptizing slaves without their master's consent. Now, Agobard composed several quite innovative polemical treatises in his efforts to reverse this decision and more generally to restrict Jews' influence within Christian society. In On Jewish Superstition and Errors, he also used conciliar canons to argue that Jews posed a danger to Christendom and ought to be constrained in their contacts with and influence over Christians. Amulo of Lyon, his successor in 840, undertook a similar campaign, although I suspect he was motivated as much by the fears that Jews might convert to Christianity, or Christians might convert to Judaism as the hope that Jews would convert to Christianity, and he, not without reason, actually. Amulo likewise wrote a treatise in which he argued that everyone ought to segregate themselves from the Jews' company according to ecclesiastical statutes, and he cited many of the same conciliar canons to support his arguments. So into this sort of hotbed of polemic and proselytism and um, sort of general nastiness, the bishop's deacon and jurist consult Flores combined, compiled two thematic collections on fleeing the Jews' contagion and on the Jews' coercion. The first, possibly compiled for Agobard's use in 827, incorporated four, counts, four canons from Toledo IV. Canon 59, which recalled baptized Jews to Christianity, a fraction of Canon 57, which deemed them Christians, Canon 62, which barred the baptized from socializing with Jews, and a fragment of Canon 58. Canon 58 was so abridged that it simply states, it is fitting for those it is fitting that he who is made a patron to the enemies of Christ be separated from the body of Christ. But the, canon, the extract of Canon 57 is longer, but it's no less altered. Introduced with the phrase, on baptized Jews, it begins, and this is from Canon 57, but those who have been compelled to Christianity because they have already been associated with the divine sacraments, dot, dot, you know, yada, 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 it is fitting that they be compelled to keep the faith. So not only did Flores erase the canon's historical context in the reference to Sisabut, it in completely expunged the original's ban on compulsory conversion. Despite its title, On the Jews' Coercion contains little to do with Jews and almost nothing to do with their coercion. But the scriptorium at Lyon did incorporate one piece of Roman legislation denying Jews the ability to practice law and a letter from an anonymous bishop, presumably from Lyon, although it's not known, we're not entirely sure about this, to an equally anonymous emperor on baptizing the Hebrews. In this letter that is more or less now a canon because it's incorporated into a canonical collection, this bishop writes that he had begun to proselytize and he'd converted many Jews, but he was so successful that anxious parents in Maison, Vienne, and Chalon sent their children away to Arles, which is, he says is sort of a lesser part of the province. Um, Nevertheless, six boys and 47 others were baptized. So the bishop then asks the emperor to assist him in ensuring that the baptized continuous Christians and returning the children sent to Arles so that the bishop can sort of pick up where he left off. Now these collections do not appear to have been very popular, but they were part of a larger program of copying, compiling, and circulating, and eventually repromulgating these earlier canons. Again, reportedly at Amulo's behest, the Council of Paris Mio considered the status of the Jews and thereafter recorded the judgments of the sacred canons and the ancient kings and laws against the Jews. These included many of the canons cited by Agobard, Amulo, and Flores, most of which were sort of bundled into canon 73. And then there are two canons from Toledo IV were added as canon 74 and canon 75, respectively. So Canon 74, again, it's a bit of Canon 58, barring Christians from accepting gifts from Jews. And Canon 75 incorporated the Canon under Canon 60 under the heading that the sons of Jews, 
that they should be separated from their parents and entrusted to Christians. And like Canon 73, this is, we can sort of trace this, albeit less directly, back to Lyon. Since that little rubric that introduces the canon in the council, the sons of Jews, that, so that they should not, that they should be separated from their parents and trusted to Christians, comes from the Collectio Hispana Systematica. And the Collectio Hispana Systematica survives in exactly four copies. The two earliest are from, were copied at Lyon in the early, in the late eighth and early ninth century. Um, the later ones are Arabic from Spain, and then there's another one that was um, copied in the late or early 10th century, also in southern France, probably also at Lyon. Um, again, like their predecessors at Toledo, these canons had sort of a limited practical contemporary effect. They were among those which Charles the Bald did not ratify at the Diet of Epernay but they did make their way into other collections, a few of them eventually circulating under the title of Charlemagne's Capitulary Against the Jews. So it wasn't very effective, but the bishops' proselytism did have repercussions beyond their, their diocese. Now despite all of this promulgating and copying and so on, these canons' proliferation did not establish their pre yet establish their preeminence, and there remained significant scope for disagreement. During the 10th century, we have the Council of Erfurt suggested that the coerced baptisms were permissible, even commendable. Gerhard of Mainz, a de deacon and jurist, indirectly argued that such baptisms were not allowable. And Pope Leo VII implied that while a bishop could exile those Jews refusing to be baptized, their baptism should still be completely voluntary. As with, Toledo, as with the Toledan canons and Gregorian decretals, this flurry of opinions arose in response to something quite specific, a letter purportedly from the Doge of, and the bishops of Venice to King Henry I, Hildebert the Archbishop of Mainz, and other German bishops, recounting a mass conversion in Jerusalem and Byzantium. It's highly doubtful that this conversion actually happened, but it left quite an impression on the council. And it was reportedly sent to counter sort of a wicked report about the, about the sepulcher in Jerusalem that was being circulated by a Jew from Jerusalem. So the letter explains that after a conflict between Christians and Jews, both communities agreed to close their sacred spaces, the synagogue and the sepulcher, and I, I assume this means the church of the sepulcher, for a test of signs. After these three days, the church was divinely opened and it was illuminated and an image of Christ crucified appears and the synagogue remains empty. According to the letter, the Hebrews are thrown into confusion by this marvel and they believed and were baptized. And there's a really interesting oscillation between Jews and Hebrews in this letter that I don't really have time to address, but it's, it's worth looking at if you have the time. Jerusalem's patriarch then wrote to the emperor in Constantinople, urging him to convert the empire's Jews. The empire acquiesced, ordering all the Jews to be baptized, but upon hearing the miracle at Jerusalem, the Hebrews voluntarily believed and were baptized. So the letter requests announced this miracle to all the Hebrews and enjoined them to be baptized. Anyone who did not want to be baptized, it's, this is a little odd, should not touch a cross in any form. And further, if anyone does not want to be a Christian, let him depart scattered and scorned from your kingdom. So this letter was read at the Council of Erfurt in 932, where it made such an impression that the assembly incorporated it into its proceedings, and this is how the letter survives. They also added their own summary to the epitome of canons, which provides an interesting counterpoint to the original. According to the council, in the wake of the clash between the two communities, the Jews and Christians again agreed to close the, Jew the Christian temple and the Jewish sanctuary for three days. On the third day, according to the council, the temple was opened and Christ crucified again was visible to the Christians. But the Jews were driven back when they tried to enter. And the more they tried to enter, the further they were driven back. Now, according to the council, terrified by this sign, all the Jews who were beyond the sea were baptized. And for this reason, it is ordered in this letter that all the Jews dwelling among Christian, Christians should either be baptized or exiled from Christianity. 
So the council has collapsed the conversion of Jerusalem and Byzantium's Jews, refused the Jews the sight of this Christian miracle, and transformed the future converts from confused to terrified, and recommended expelling the Jews from all of Christendom and not just sort of the immediate Germanic kingdom. Now, to all appearances, no immediate steps were taken to expel anyone refusing to be baptized. But Hildebrandt's successor at Mainz, Friedrich, seems to have possibly investigated the possibility of this um, shortly after his election in 937. And he requested, or at any rate received, a compilation of legal authorities dealing with the several issues, including the legal status of Jews and compulsory baptism among them from his deacon Gerhardt. And like Gerhardt, like Floris, Gerhardt adapted early authorities, but unlike Floris, Gerhardt deferred to Gregory I. Um, so he borrowed from a 9th century life and um, cites Gregory's letter in which he forbade the use of coercion under the heading that Gregory strove to banish the perfidy of the Jews by arguments rather than violence. And like Braulio, it's likely that he wasn't unaware of earlier things because elsewhere in his collection, he used canons from Paris Mew, including the capitulary, Charlemagne's capitulary against the Jews. But in dealing with Jews and conversion and baptism, Gerhardt relied solely on the life of Gregory, concluding as his source did, that Gregory forbade the Jews be violently baptized. Despite Gerhardt's firm asservations that force was unwarranted, Friedrich still wrote to Pope Leo VII in the same year, asking, among other things, whether it was preferable to subjugate the Jews to Christianity or to expel them. Leo, ignoring or unaware of the Gregorian decretals and the Toledan councils that deal with this, instructed Friedrich to preach the faith of the Trinity and the mystery of the Incarnation, and if Jews want to believe and be baptized with a whole heart, let us give thanks to the omnipotent Lord with infinite praises. However, if they do not wish to believe, expel them from your communities with our authority. Endorsing the naked threat of exile, Leo still insists that Friedrich should not baptize Jews by force or without their desire or request, citing, again, not these earlier canons, but the Gospels of Matthew, do not give what is holy to the dogs and do not cast your pearls before swine. So like Gerhard and Gregory, Leo's maintaining that consent is imperative, but you know, you can still expel anyone who doesn't agree. So alongside these erratic and confusing developments in canon law, there are three sort of anomalies which I'd like to touch on really quickly, which either considered other topics altogether or were sort of at variance with their contemporaries. The Council of Paris held in 614 addressed baptism as a function of public office. It forbade Jews holding office, which was a common preoccupation in Roman and early canon law, and decreed that any Jew who attempted to seek or exercise either public office or military service was to obtain the grace of baptism with his entire family from the bishop of the city where he sought this authority. Um, and again, it's not really clear why this is happening. Um, Clotho II shortly thereafter issued the Edict of Paris, which likewise forbade Jews exercising public office. But there's not really, it's not really clear why the bishops thought this was important, except perhaps as kind of a retroactive insurance that anyone wielding martial or official authority would be Christians. Um, and the Second Council of Nicaea, which was convened in 787 by the Empress Irene in an attempt to end iconoclasm. And, then, and this is the last of the great ecumenical councils, which I guess is relevant with Francis's visit, which among other things I think is trying to heal the schism with the Greek church. So this is the last big canon before the, or big council before that happened. Um, and obviously icons and clerical duties dominated its proceedings, but it did turn its attention to falsely baptized Jews. And unlike the councils that were held in the previous century on the Iberian Peninsula, this council shared late antiquity's doubts about the advisability of baptizing Jews who were not fully or actually converted to Christianity. Attended by legates from Rome, the council was translated into Latin and transmitted into the Latin church. Um, according to the Latin tr translation, which does not seem to have wandered far from the original Greek, Jews pretending to become Christians but continuing to observe Judaism in secret made a mockery of Christ. Such false converts should not be received into the communion or prayer or into the church. Rather, they should openly be Hebrews following their own religion, nor should their sons be baptized. 
Only those who had converted sincerely, confessed wholeheartedly, and been censured and corrected merited baptism. And then might they and their children be admitted and baptized, but also to be watched to see that they abandon Hebraic conventions. Otherwise, they are not to be admitted for any reason. Despite papal approbation and attempts to promulgate this legislation within the Latin church, this council was not widely accepted or even known in Latin Christendom, um, presumably for political reasons, largely because it was vehemently opposed by Charlemagne, who wasn't, he wasn't really interested in this issue of Jewish converts and their baptism, but there was some sort of grossly translated icon iconophilia left over from the um, getting rid of iconoclasm that he seems to have been quite incensed by as, and was also sort of offended by the council's convocation by a woman. So it's, um, he commissioned the Bishop of Orléans to compose a refutation, the Libri Caroloni. Um, and so this, this canon about baptism seems to have sort of suffered the council's um, sort of obs subsequent obscurity. So finally, there is the Pope's Nicholas le letter to the Bulgarians of 866, and this is the most anomalous of our outliers. For Nicholas not only proffered opinions and advice at variance with contemporaries, he addressed an issue that no pope or council had hitherto considered, whether it was possible for a Jew to baptize someone else. So it's a lengthy letter um, dealing with a multitude of questions about Christian theology and practice. And one of the last of these concerns the status of, a bap of those baptized by a Jew who may or may not himself have been baptized. And the le letter says he may have been a Christian or a pagan, and they don't know. Um, so long as the recipients have been baptized in the name of Christ or the Trinity, Nicholas assures his correspondents, they were baptized and they don't need to be rebaptized. And this is a whole other can of worms in baptism and canon law. Um, but he added, first it should be ascertained whether this Jew was a Christian or a pagan or if he was later made a Christian. So it's clearly preferable for a Jew to have been baptized before he starts baptizing everybody else. But as long as he's saying the right words in the right order, it's not altogether necessary that you be a Christian before you start baptizing people. Now, Christian, now Nicholas is obviously sort of the furthest of, these, of the outlying edicts. He's dealing with whether or not a Jew can baptize someone and not as the other canons we've, I've discussed today m whether or not a Jew can be baptized. Now I hope I've made clear that despite the best efforts of later canonists like Gratian and his Decretum, these decisions did not share an underlying harmony or coherence. Even where canons and their authors agree on some points, as for example, Leo VII and Gregory I did on the necessity of consent, they might disagree on other points, namely why consent is important, and where they agreed on the dangers, as um, the, council, the Second Council of Nicaea and the Fourth Council of Toledo did, they were not necessarily in accord as to the ideal outcome. So we find in Toledo the, f the fourth demanding that baptized Jews remain Christians, lest the Lord's name be blasphemed, while Nicaea the second insists that insincere converts returning must return to Judaism because those pretending to be Christians while observing the Sabbath and Jewish rituals secretly made a mockery of Christ. So with apologies to Gratian, these dictates I I think were born of different, inconsistent, often incoherent traditions of canon law. Born of different circumstances, different concerns, different expectations, and different ideals. So Gregory following in the mold of the Ca Council of Agda and early Roman law deems it absolutely imperative that conversions from Judaism be voluntary and sincere, while Leo coming out of this 10th century discourse on baptism exile thinks baptism should be sincere but it's okay to sort of kick anybody out who doesn't think who doesn't agree 
Similarly, the intervening councils of Toledo, Paris, and Nicaea belong respectively to a series of councils and canons that tried, and mostly quite unsuccessfully in this period, to retain and later in Lyon to obtain baptized Jews with, for the church, to efforts that tried to limit Jews' ability to hold office or exercise authority over Christians, and again, and finally, this eighth century echo of early Roman legislation at Nicaea that sought to return fictive converts or the fictive baptisms to Jewish law. So all these idiosyncrasies, contradictions, and occasional incoherence, I think, offer sort of a glimpse into the messier negotiations, these very messy negotiations between new converts and their new community, something we don't always see except in um, autobiographies like Herman Judah's. That they're, so, they're often obscure in conversion sermons and polemics and disputational texts. Um, about, and, so, and we also see Christian communities' own disagreements about who can convert, when they can convert, and whether someone who had converted too hastily, insincerely, or unwillingly should remain a Christian or go back to being a Jew. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, the last speaker and the respondent of uh, this session will be Ephraim Effi. We know him better as Effi, Effi Shoam. Effi is a historian speci uh, specializing in medieval European Jewish history. He teaches here at the Department of Jewish History at Ben Gurion University. His first book, published in, uh, by Shazar, publishing Hebrew in 2008, has just come out in English title, Mazal Tov Effi, on uh, his name, uh, on the emergence of a minority, leprosy, madness, and uh, disability among the Jews of uh, medieval Europe. By Wayne State University Press. His next book will be a focus on Jewish uh, involvement in crime in medieval Western Europe. The book's working title is Medieval Jewish Criminal Underworld. Effie, please. Thank you, Rami, and thank you to all the speakers. Um, I will be honest with you, when I prepared my comments for the papers uh, to be delivered today, I was very brief, yet yesterday with um, David Sorotskin, uh, Uriel Simonson, and Nimrod Hurwitz's uh, very elaborate presentations as respondents to uh, yesterday's lecture, I felt that I am falling short. Nevertheless, time is pressing, so I'm not going to discuss all the things and all the points I wish to share with you uh, about these papers. Um, I will, however, try and kind of fuse them together uh, or, or see a common th several common threads, although they are uh, both geographically and temporally um, in, a, in a large range here uh, between uh, Celtic-speaking peoples of Hibernia uh, in the west and the forests of Thuringia and from Mayor of Rothenburg's uh, holding cell in, in uh, the castle of Enzisheim in, in Elsass and, uh, uh, I don't know, Augustine of Hippo's palace, bishop, bishop's palace in, in, in Hippo. Um, the first issue touched upon by all three participants is how and to what extent can normative sources speak social history? Um, by this I mean to what extent can we as scholars engage in the pursuit of the elusive term conversion talk about social truths when in many cases all we have left are one-sided accounts in this case normative sources as uh, Roy has pointed out of occurrences that usually involve more than one party. Um, and I want to, us to remember that the phenomena that we are discussing, and it is at the very heart of this um, conference, um, is the elusive term uh, um, conversion. Uh, it's basically and fundamentally a socially transformative experience uh, for both the convert, his immediate surrounding, and for the body of society he or she are converting from, or he or, and he and she are converting to. Um, it is my impression that all three papers address this question head-on, realizing both the potential shortcomings of normative texts 
yet reading them either against the grain or making the most of them, especially when these texts are corroborated by historical context. Um, the need to regulate life and the need to record regulatory attempts by interested parties like the missionaries discussed in Wei's talk uh, left us with a relatively impressive body of legislative work that enables us to reconstruct, not without exercising uh, the necessary uh, methods of caution, uh, the process of absorbing what seems to be not only one society into another, but also one legal system into another. Um, but also in the other talks, we find how normative legal sources um, can speak volumes, especially when other sources are either absent altogether or conspicuously silent. Uh, let us take, for instance, uh, the last talk by uh, Jesse Sherwood about the councils of Toledo for instance, and the list of canons relating to the conversion of the Jews that were penned and preserved in by the notaries of the 7th century and as she uh, very uh, elaborately showed were copied later on in Lyon. Um, it comes, I guess, as no surprise to most of us that apart from these accounts, uh, we have absolutely no record of these events in internal Jewish sources uh, that relate to what may have been or may have uh, attempted to be a mass conversion of Jews in uh, Iberia or the subsequent expulsion of people who did not succumb to, um, to conversion from the Iberian Peninsula. Um, so we have absolutely no Jewish records to that effect. Um, Roy, Roy showed us how with the lack of the local pre-Christian sources, it is only up to the Christian uh, missionary writings and the legal uh, uh, material that resulted from uh, the exchange of letters between the missionaries and the Pope or other uh, legal officials, Christian legal officials, to convey to us the voices of the, both the pre-Christian society as well as the ways by which local pre-Christian legal systems and moral, ethical, phys fiscal, and familial codes were incorporated and negotiated into the newly emerging Christian kingdoms of Ireland, Saxony, or Bulgaria. A Frank Kanterfogel showed the fascinating distinction between the northern French Jewish legal authorities and the, their contemporary Jewish legal authorities, German Jewish legal authorities, relying almost solely on the legal normative writing of the male learned elite with hardly a shred of evidence from the actual voices of the people the entire talk revolves around, namely the converts themselves, male and female alike. Um, so y we have here an attempt, a, a very, uh, uh, I think, ambitious attempt to try and reconstruct history from what we have and with the use of, of you know, imagination, innovation, non-positivistic seasoning, if you wish, um, in an attempt to uh, kind of arrive at a, a rather nuanced and, and uh, conclusive uh, uh, discussion. The second point I wish to address uh, is the concern that silver lines kind of all the talks that we heard today. Many of the normative, in this case legal sources, express their subtle or outright distrust at those performing conversion. In their writing, lingering in the background of almost any discussion on conversion, even those that were overseen by legal authorities and performed properly, uh, depending on when <laughs> the immersion took place, um, the fear of a lapsing convert lurks in the background. And there is always a constant feeling uh, that those whose hearts and minds were seemingly one may actually have seen, may actually have had second thoughts, uh, and that they will lapse to their old faith. The concept of social networks discussed yesterday by Uriel and the survival of such networks beyond the threshold of the new religion left us, um, or left more than a shadow of doubt over the sincerity of the act of conversion, um, especially when conversion was performed en masse. And relatively large numbers of neophyti were accepted into the fold of any religion, as is evident from Roy Flechner, Jesse Sherwood, and I would suggest also uh, probably uh, in the talks that will discuss the issue of uh, the mass conversions into Islam uh, in the uh, early Middle Ages. Indeed, the fear of the social religious body being penetrated by a foreign body and the assertion that that body uh, was not wholly willing to assimilate into the new collective brought with it a fear of contamination, thoughts of alienation, estrangement, and constant fears of subversion. Uh, the fear is manifested even in the language or even in uh, when we have 
uh, the language of the source is speaking positively about conversion in such uh, that it projects a sense of earnesty and sincerity in the conversion. And one of the examples discussed here by Frank Kannerfogel and also yesterday by Paula, um, the mid-12th century rabbi Joel Halevi of Bonn discusses a certain proselyte to Judaism named Avram, son of Avram. He's also referred to as a rabbi, which is interesting. It seems that this certain Ger, a learned man who arrived into the Jewish fold with an ability to read and write Latin, was sitting probably in a study hall of yeshiva or a synagogue or maybe the same, uh, copying from one from what uh, the text calls Sefer Pasul Shel Galachim a um, wrong book of priests. Now note the word pasul in the minds of people who speak Hebrew and read Hebrew. Pasul also denotes and kind of um, gives a sense of pesel. Uh, so we're talking about a kind of uh, uh, um, attitude issue there. Um, but the man is explained uh, to the wondering Joel who is asking him about his actions that in his attempt to school himself in the laws of the newly accepted religion, he was still using the Vulgata and therefore making his own copy, maybe even a diglosa copy of both the Hebrew and the running Latin translation because of his yet poor understanding of the original language of scriptures, namely Hebrew. I'm using it as an exegesis. Vehuli kmo perush, he says to Joel. Um, moreover, he told Joel that the original book that he was copying from, the Vulgata, was a book that he received from the rabbis of Speyer. Not something he brought in from his old religion, but something he received from the, probably the rabbinical court who actually accepted him into the fold. Uh, we can only hypothesize about how such a book came to the possession of the rabbinic uh, court of Speyer, uh, maybe collateral for a money loan, uh, I, I don't know. It doesn't say so in the text. The story is telling in many ways, and we may discuss it further, but for the sake of the point I'm trying to make here, um, about the fear of reverting a reverting convert, we should focus on Rabbi Joel's concern. Joel's concern about the proselyte using the Latin version of scripture can be understood on many levels. It may be the fear of contamination or subversion of knowledge. It may be also the fear of the presence of an artifact charged with a former religion's religious significance itself in the presence of a convert serving as a possible conduit invoking memories that may undermine the conversion process altogether. Um, like, um, you know, a whiskey bottle in AA meeting. Um, or it could be the possible real or imagined danger of the object, uh, possibly decorated, illuminated, or ornamented, uh, it might, that may have aroused uh, the fears of, of Rabbi Yoel. But it can also be that Joel was fearing that through, that although the convert was sincere and is depicted as such, he may meander back and retrieve into his cradle faith. And thank you, Paula, yesterday for uh, introducing that concept. I love it. Um, uh, indeed, we should look at the opening metaphor that Joel uses when he describes the convert. And this is how he begins. And a wind blew from unto God, and it eventually dwelled in the heart of this man, Rabbi Avram, son of Avram. The term in a wind blew from unto God, Veruach Nasame et Hashem, is a unique quote from the book of Numbers, chapter 11. Now let's remind ourselves what Numbers 11 is all about. The entire chapter discusses two major Jewish, two major events that occur simultaneously in the Israelite encampment during the wanderings in uh, uh, the desert. The Israelites' obsession with eating meat and their complaints to Moses on this matter, on the one hand, on, and Moses expressing his fatigue in carrying the burden and the troubles on the Israelites on his shoulders on the other. The prescribed divine remedy for this fatigue expressed by Moses is the assembling of 70 elders and their endowment with the Spirit of God. As the drama of the 70 elders comes to an end and Moses and the spiritually endowed elders return to the, Israelites camp, the Israelite camp, scripture tells us about how a wind has blown from onto God and that this wind brought with it and sought with it the solution for the meat problem. It brought in, if you want, the metaphorical chickens from yesterday, okay? The slav. It may be 
an overreading on my behalf, but I think that some of Joel's concern about Avram's purity of intentions lay in his choice of biblical illusions that he is making when kicking off his discussion about the convert Avram ben Avram, and when he conveys the story to his readers. Numbers 11 is a chapter where the issues of flesh and the spirit are at grips where we find individuals that are bestowed with divine spirit prophesizing even if they are not at the assembly of the 70 elders like Eldad and Medad that remain in the encampment. Um, indeed Joel was using two contradicting Hebrew verses and metaphors when describing Avram. One is the wind that had blown from unto God that has cast the Slav uh, around and across the Israelite encampment and two the spirit that had settled upon the 70 elders. When the spirit settles in the heart of Avram, he uses the first and not the second. Um, it should be noted that the word Hebrew word ruach can mean both, both the wind and the spirit. So he's playing here on words, and I think that it is a pun intended. Um, my final comment uh, is about language. Um, and uh, the need for cultural and linguistic mediation. Uh, the story of Avram, son of Avram, the proselyte we have just discussed, brings this issue to the forefront. The ability to reach out to potential converts with articles of one's faith or the ability to approach the new arrivals to the faith after a mass conversion occurs relies heavily on the need of cultural negotiation, mediation, translation, and the concept of both language, concept, terms, and codes. Language, terminology, interpretation all play a crucial role in this game of spiritual game and game. And, and it is no surprise that when Chaim yesterday in his opening address told the story of Herman of Cologne, um, he highlighted the fact that Herman writes of how he taught himself the Latin characters as a conduit into the Reli new religious life he is seeking. Um, I think this is uh, this matter is more present with regard to the issues discussed by Roy and Jesse, uh, and, le and with Roy less so by Jesse and Ephraim. But nevertheless, as the story of Avram the Proselyte tells us, even when there seems to be a common linguistic ground upon which conversion may rest, there still are matters that need translation. Um, all the papers in this session have revolved around law and the use of legal sources, and although conveying theological theory is probably not half as easy as it is, uh, no wonder that Avram is copying a Pentateuch. He's not copying a Misale. He's not using a uh, translation of the Psalms in order to help him or aid him pray more properly in the Hebrew version, but rather he is reverting back to the law, to the Pentateuch, to the Chumash. Uh, so that is also a, a, a point to be noticed. However, when discussing this law and when we look at the normative sources, we learn how important it is to read carefully and appreciate nuance. Another aspect I find novel about all the talks in this session is that we should put aside uh, the past treatment of these religions as whole and monolith, and I think this came out in all three talks, how things should be discussed in more nuanced and more detail. Uh, it, uh, I think, projected very strongly in how uh, Jesse and Roy uh, discussed things when they said that basically before the 11th century we cannot talk about canon law. There is a whole array of, of councils, bishops, uh, and, and other um, authorities that can be consulted and, and the same can be said about the nuanced and fine line that Ephraim Kennerfogel was trying to drive when he was making the distinction between the Ashkenazi, uh, the Ashkenazi Tosafist and the uh, Sephardi Tosafist. Um, to conclude, um, I would like to pitch a question to all three participants and by that maybe open the discussion. Um, we discussed normative sources. How would you discuss or how would you fit the non-normative sources into your discussion? Uh, and I will refer to two, uh, two issues. One is something that I learned from uh, Jesse Sherwood's talk and I think complements uh, Ephraim Kannerfogel to, uh, Kannerfogel's talk, the issue of fasting before conversion, uh, something that appeared in Sefer Asufot sort of out of nowhere when you look back at canon law, there it is. So may these 
uh, uh, legal systems be discussing or talking with one another, appropriating from one another? Um, one question. Number two, um, how do non-normative sources fit into your discussion in the sense that we have, for instance, and this is a question for you especially, Ephraim, um, uh, Rami Reiner published last year, he was one of uh, a team of three that published the huge volumes on uh, the uh, Würzburg Matsevot. Uh, we have uh, epitaphs. We have an epitaph of a female convert to Judaism, not from France, but rather from Germany. So um, although you were uh, uh, pitching one of those uh, issues, uh, I would like to hear your opinion on that. So thank you very much to all speakers. Thank you, Ephraim. And uh, now we have a short time for question, questions. Uh, for Solaska, please. I just want to ask Ephraim the, the short question and the longer question. The short question is Do you have any zits and labels for a one year old Christian child who's being converted? And the longer one is whether you think there's any relationship between the uh, eschatological views of the Balea Tosafot in France and Germany and the issue of conversion. Yeah. Um, as far as the Zitzelay, but it is a very unusual case. It sounds like, I mean, it's obviously a case of some kind of a foundling. Uh, obviously, this child has, and that, that raises a whole host of other issues. I thought about this a little bit, and there's nothing in the text that gives any firm direction. Question is, the community finds this child, and, and, and where are the Christians? So it remains, I, I don't have much to go on, and, and it's, a, it's a very fair question. Um, as far as the larger question, the problem here, and it goes back to what I said at the beginning, um, we're, we're all, all of us in this, in this little field are doing very well now trying to look at these distinctions between Northern France and Germany. Uh, very often they are not there. So I've written myself about eschatological issues, and there uh, the point I made was that, you know, as opposed to the Maimonidian view, which is extremely consistent, as Maimonides always is, if you go into the Tosafists and run the same questions, you get a remarkably consistent, different position. It's not the position itself which is unexpected, it's the consistency, and that consistency is in both in France and Germany. So I don't really see the same cleavage there. As I alluded to in the talk, in terms of prospective, uh, I'm sorry, uh, reverting con conversion, uh, you know, reverting converts, converts to Christianity, reverting back to Judaism, there, even though, again, there's a certain amount that goes in parallel, at some point the Germans, having to do with Levite marriages and such, are, uh, again, and, and somebody raised this yesterday, Guriel, which is the stricter position. The Germans considered the, the, the non-Jewish, uh, I'm sorry, the, the converted potential lever to be uh, a Christian for that purpose. So y you have to look at these things as closely as possible. Um, just, just let me say, as long as just to piggyback on, on, on the issue that, that uh, Ephraim raised, that Ephraim raised, um, again, there's no doubt that there were converts in Germany during this period, at least a few. So the, the tombstone in Wurzburg is, you know, obviously correct. The issue is, and the point that I was trying to make was, what is, where is the rabbinic policy? How does it perhaps dovetail? Mm -hmm. So it's not, uh, you know, it, almost I was going to say when you started to talk about Avraham ben Avraham in in, um, in Bonn and in, in Würzburg, he was at Würzburg too, and in, in Spires all around. He's a, um, he's, a, he's a German, it's a German context, so your whole very interesting analysis about the Slav that he sort of, um, uh, you know, this whole case, this, you know, interesting case that Effie just brought up, um, it, it, you know, to say, well, it's German, so of course he's a bit more conservative with a small C on this, but again, I think sometimes you can cut the, you can cut it too fine, but I have no, pro in other words, it doesn't do a thing to what I've said that we find converts in Germany. The question is, uh, what is the rabbinic uh, uh, position, and how does that, as you suggested, how does that then correlate or not correlate other things, and your point about absence of source is absolutely correct. We have, as far as I know, and again, colleagues will, will, will help me with this, um, you know, not only a dearth, a, a, an almost non-existence of archival material in this area in this period, so we're left to, you know, some imagination, hopefully not uh, too fantastic. Okay. Well, yeah.
hand the Toledo canons which were being cited in the 18th century, directly. Quia consta, distinction 45, the phrase in Quia Sincera. Now, once it's known, what does it mean once it's known? The person has to, has to remain. So there's this tremendous tension because if someone becomes an apostate, which is a Jew who is forced and then goes back, then that person befouls Christianity, pollutes the sacred body, the corpus mystical. And, they, and therefore, the, the discussions have to be very, very ginger. They're going to call a convert somebody who, even though that's illegal, somebody who maybe is just a returnee. In Germany, too, well, the customary law is much more prevalent. So you're going to get the kind of discussions you get. In France, there's a bit of influence of Roman law in the schools. And so it's liable to be that. In other words, what I'm saying, excuse me for being long, and I know that we have to end in two minutes, but, but, but the, the fact is that I think somehow we have to really try to socialize this material to find out what it's really saying. Jesse, I agree. <laughs> this is a good answer. <laughs> I disagree. Uh, because be, because that's, uh, that's always the case. That's how I make my living. Um, uh, because, Ken, in these legal sources, and that's, you know, that'll be the next conference, the next paper, that's actually going to be a book, but the returning apostates in medieval Ashkenaz, northern France and Germany, there's a completely different vocabulary, and Mishumadim and Geirim are rarely, if ever, linked. Mishumadim apostates, Geirim converts, rarely, if ever, linked. But in the few cases where they are, and there are whole discussions of returning apostates separately, it's voluminous, much more voluminous than this material. So, number one. Number two, where you get interface, you get in some interesting places. For example, Ravia, Eliezer ben Joel Halevi, who's gotten some press today. Um, there's a passage uh, that is a, a work of his that is lost, so we reconstruct the manuscript, but it's there. It's there all over the place. Talks about the returning apostate and the fact that his uh, immersion when he returns, this apostate, has to be Kitger as a convert, but it may be at night which is not true for the immersion of a convert, at least not a priori, that's got to be done as a judicial practice by day. However, his acceptance has to be in front of a board of three, and he's the most stringent in that regard. So these terms are used very, very precisely. There's a whole piece of literature of Mishumadim. Where you find any interface, you can separate it very, very clearly, and therefore, I... <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. I will. I now. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, and thank you to the all our all speakers right. in this session. Okay, and we can ask in the coffee break. Okay. Uh, you know, and uh, we will meet in here again at uh, 11:50. Thank you.